I'm here today as a result of very two things. Very generous people that pass along their skill sets. I'm just a vessel of the brilliance that people have added onto me. But I also had that hunger to learn and then came to understand that was teaching and training people. So you don't get business acumen going to school. You don't get a skill going to school. You get a skill being committed and taking action. We're not in the real estate business. We're in the human resource business. We're in the human behavior business. Period, end of discussion. You can throw everything out on the street. It's worth nothing. This episode is sponsored by Follow Up Boss. And I know you, Justin, and Lindsay both know that I made the switch about a year ago to Follow Up Boss um, from being in one CRM for the last like 13 years. I read a stat the other day that 32 of the top 50 teams in the United States use Follow Up Boss already. So, I mean, I guess the proof's in the pudding there. So whether you have a super team like George or a mini team like me, Follow Up Boss makes it super easy for teams of all sizes to get organized, stay on top of their leads and spheres with less effort and improve overall performance so you can scale your business. And thanks to Fub, all of our listeners can double their free trial and get a full 30 days to see how Follow Up Boss can level up your business. And there's no contract necessary, no credit cards required, uh, completely free to give it a go. So visit followupboss.com forward slash inspection period for more details. And thanks Follow Up Boss for making this possible. All right, welcome back to another episode of the inspection period. My name's Justin. I'm George. And I'm Lindsay. And uh, every single week, we're coming to you with incredible guests like our guest today, John Cheplak, from across the real estate industry and beyond, kind of uncovering those hidden secrets for success and not just what they're doing now, but what made them successful, what got them to that place so we can uncover that universal kind of wisdom that applies to, it it doesn't matter what stage of your business you're in, whether you're just starting or whether you're a seasoned entrepreneur and you're in that stage, we want to make sure that the uh, advice and the stories that are shared applies to everybody. And today I'm very, very honored to introduce my friend, John Cheplak. So uh, John, welcome to the podcast. I mean, I got like a sort of formal intro for you, but I know you'd kind of hate that. I think that you're probably going to like dip (laughs) off screen if I start rolling through some form of pod (laughs) like intro. But I mean, just the highlight of John, like he is a coach to the largest names that exist in the real estate industry. Uh, He is world renowned for having this kind of action oriented coaching program that is not just frilly, but like actually boots on the ground. And that's important because like John still, he's a 70 one-on-one calls a month, him personally, like running this huge organization. Oh, a week. Holy cow. 70 a week. Sorry about that. That's part time now. (laughs) That's part time. So like (laughs) he's actually in the trenches doing this with Mm -hmm. people. And my favorite thing about John is that he's always had this like kind of a a abundance mentality, right? Like this, Mm -hmm. this idea that like, if we share and if we continue to uh, operate in that way, rising tides raise all shit which is very rare in the real estate industry. And you have this crazy cool background that like how you got here in the first place, you know, and your humble approach to how you do things also counterbalanced with your like, you better get your done or <laughs> things are not going to work is like a really refreshing approach because I, I'm, I'm in this space, honestly, in the tech, in the tech world, right? Where like everybody thinks they have an idea. Well, ideas are not worth shit, honestly. It's execution that matters, right? Execution is what actually gets paid. And your mm-hmm. emphasis on et- uh, execution is no wonder the teams that you are coaching and the people that you're coaching are succeeding, even in down markets, having like the best years and best months of their entire careers, man. So mm-hmm. welcome to the podcast. Excited to have you, man. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a privilege to be with you guys. It really is. We're going to have some fun. Yeah, we are. So... <laughs> I think our first kind of questions is we want to go back to like what little John, what was uh what was that like? Little tell John. us little John. Like tell was us there a ever little, a little John? Of- yeah, for those of you that don't like aren't watching this on video, like John is like a bodybuilder. Like if I jump, I'll get like a ping from him and Dan Beer every now and again to jump on FaceTime. And John's like literally on a treadmaster, like sweating into the phone as we like talk. So just know he is in wicked shape. So anyways. Yeah. <laughs> but take us back. Give us some uh, kind of origin of like where you came from. And, you know, obviously we know you as I think you're you go without an intro, but you're a, a badass mentor today. And how did you how did you get here? What was what was the early days like? Sure, I was a uh, and thank you again. It's really a privilege to hang out with you guys. And you know, my hope is always and and as you let in is to contribute to people and give them what's really taking place and um, also give a borrowed belief. Um, 
I think that's the thing to do is one thing I'd say to everyone is anything you hear that I might share is a, is a result of other people that have inspired me. Um, I think it's really important that you do compare yourself to others. You know, people tell you not to compare yourself to others. And I always say, well, that's kind of a mystery. Um, how can I know what's actually possible if I don't compare myself to others? So hopefully somewhere in this story, there's a comparison where you go, man, I can do that and more because that's what I want to see everyone do. I was a, t um, a bouncer in a teen nightclub and a janitor um, when the nightclub closed in Seattle, Washington. And then I would drive underneath the Space Needle to a seafood warehouse. And they have this thing that many of you, and I think you guys are all too young too. They have this thing called a fax machine. And on this fax machine, <laughs> a piece of paper would come across. And, and that piece of paper had orders from, from grocery stores and, and uh, restaurants of seafood orders. And so, so I would have to take the five pound tilapia, the 10 pounds of flounder, the 20 pounds of crab. I would bag it, I would box it, and I'd, dr I'd drive it around. So I did that about 110 hours a week. So the one thing that I was fortunate Jeez. is that I had a work ethic. Um, <laughs> and some might just say, no, you're just psycho. And that's correct too. Um, so I would work 110 hours a week and that was when the gangs were coming into Seattle big time. Uh, we're talking shoot, um, 36 years ago and, uh, had guns pulled on me. We we're in a teen nightclub and my mom said, work half as hard and, and, and do real estate. And so I said, okay. And so I went to a seminar and the guy said, knock on doors. And I said, okay. And I was dumb enough to do it. So rain gear umbrella. And I was able to sell a hundred homes myself with a, um, licensed assistant door not cold call Fisbo expired so y'all out there complaining about the freaking leads let me tell you how to do it. okay i mean unbelievable i mean you guys want like cherries on top of the lead and you don't like the sauce that was put on the lead anyways i digress um with that said um you know i went through a family situation with my daughter's health and mm -hmm. Um, and then I, I watched other people in their family situations they went through and, and maybe it was just paying their bills and, and I was able to dig deep and make it happen. I raised my hand and I said, Hey, listen, give me the people that are non-productive and, and pay me 50% of, um, their first six deals. Well, 50%, that's too much. I go, what's 50% of nothing. And so I volunteered and anyways, long story short, I got into leadership and, and I'm here today as a result of very two things very generous people that pass along their skill sets. I'm just a vessel of the brilliance that people have added onto me, but I also had that hunger to learn and then came to understand that was teaching and training people. So I, uh, um, got hired to be in a branch office in 1998 that was closing a thousand transactions a year and they had never hired from outside the company. And the market was only up. People always talk about their number, but they forget about the other number, right? Uh, the market was up 13%. I took the office from 1,000 transactions to 1,483 uh, transactions in 1998 in one office. We were not buying leads. So we're at a 14.8 per person productivity. And so, you know, I proved I could do this thing. I had no business acumen. That's the piece that I want everyone to know is, see, like, you don't, you don't get business acumen going to school. You don't get a skill going to school. Um, you get a school, you get a skill being committed and taking action and the skill is built on the field of play and then yeah. being willing to be coached after you come off that field of play. So um, just want to weave those things in. I got a headhunted Prue Cal, Nevada, Texas came and hired me and um, I'm a great salesman, man. <laughs> <laughs> and so after my sign on bonus and my contract was signed here, I went from a hundred agents to 100 offices. We owned I think 50 of them, the rest were trademark license companies. So we would service them and then they would split the, the fee with us, the, uh, the franchise fee with us. And, and I said to the, uh, the owners, after I got the job as a GM, I'm in the C-suite of this huge company, multi-state company. Why the hell did you hire me? And he said, <laughs> because you get the number one thing. And I hope everyone hears this is you understand the business we're in. We're not in the real estate business. We're in the human resource business. We're in the human behavior business period and a discussion. You can throw everything out on the street. It's worth nothing. The human being, you understand the elevator asset. Your asset comes to the office, gets on the elevator, does the work just as a figure of speech folks, as you're hearing this, because here's the other thing I love too. Oh, we are remote. Yeah. We're remote. We're cloud. Yeah. How come all the biggest remote cloud people have the biggest bricks and mortar office buildings they own, but I digress again. Anyway, <laughs> With that said, um, and so 
He said, listen, you get recruiting. He said, I can teach you everything else. Yeah. And so I was real fortunate. We, um, we grew by 300% year one, 700% year two in a major company. We, um, we would go into marketplaces and we had no offices by the end of the year. Uh, we would have five offices, 250 agents and doing millions in uh, GCI. And we weren't doing it coming in with a Zillow or realtor.com. We were doing it understanding we we're in the human resource business. And then one day my mom taught me, she said, son, never. And my mom's really my guide. My father drowned when I was we were five and four and she didn't get any life insurance or anything like that. And there was no money. My mom worked three jobs and then burned the boats herself 50 some years ago and got into real estate and went for it. But she said, you know, son, never count someone else's money. Well, one day the consultant was driving us around and, and, and being in the C-suite as a GM, I was responsible for the PL. I had the PL for the company. I had the PL for the three regions and then I had the PLs for each office. And I had to run that all up and aggregate it up. So I saw, so they had this legacy consultant and the guy would say, I've been here forever and we never seen no one do what you're doing. I'm just going to ride around and watch what you're doing. I go, what the? You're a 25K hit on the freaking p &L for one day? And I'm 400 grand? My math tells me that I'm stupid right now. And so anyways, um, evolved into coaching. And, and this is, these are the pieces too. So you're the backstory. I think what's most important is you're not hearing a whole bunch of education. You're not hearing that I came from an amazing background. And I just hope people understand that it's, it's, it's this, this grit and this willingness to take action. I woke up, I was a hero. Like I was rocking. I'm going to go be a coach. <laughs> So, and I thought the world would come after me. Well, it was interesting to note is you kind of get, when you're an executive, you're doing well, the other owners of other companies across the country don't want to educate their C-suite that they can go leave and oh, get yeah. your coach. That's the old uh, crab stuck in a crab trap situation. You know, they try to thing. rip so, your arms uh, off. Yeah, yeah so I'm going to go <laughs> man. Um, and, 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 and hear this right now, folks, as... As, as you're listening to this, and I don't know where, you know, there's some people doing good, some are struggling, and, and that's just called life. But when you hear that, man, hear, hear this struggle, right? Because it's you're committed or you're not. So I rented out um, little uh, hotel rooms across the country. And back then we had email. Like if I had Facebook and all those type of great things, man, I wouldn't even be talking to any of you. I'll be goofing off at my farm. I'd have a hundred horses. <laughs> Anyways, um, so I had email and there were 50 chairs in the room in Chicago. One person showed up. It was a free half day seminar on recruiting. Hmm. And I did an email into Atlanta and three people showed up in a 50 chair room. And then I did one down in Fort Lauderdale and six people showed up. And I went to about 40 cities in a year doing seminars and kept going and going and going. And then, um, and people weren't showing up. And then, so I was doing the free events. And so then I decided to do a couple little paying events and, um, it was on recruiting and leadership and, uh, I charged two ninety nine and three ninety and four ninety nine. I remember my third one in Tahoe, ironically, which is now a, a great venue and facility for me every single year that we go to, I remember 17 people showed up and I walked back to my guy and I says, I'm just going to play in the tech space. Cause I played around in software a little bit. I said, I suck. Um, I'm just not good at this, man. And, and he says, no, just stick with it, stick with it. And I said, no, I suck. I got a phone call from one guy that was in the room and that's the piece you guys, it just takes one person to believe in you. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and we can read all the self-help books and we can, we can go to all the seminars and, and I invest more today in coaching than I ever have. Um, I'm in Phoenix, October 3rd and 4th over mastermind.com with Dean Graciosi. Um, I'm there. Oh, you know, Dean. He's a, he's a good friend. I know him real well. So oh, really? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. 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 I, I just, uh, I'm in his and Tony's uh, Zenith mastermind. Yeah. Um, they've got a hundred folks. I'm in his edge and then his Zenith. So that's really cool. Yeah. Really, really cool. Cool dude. Um, so uh, anyways, the um, one gentleman says, Hey, I really like the event. Why don't we, why don't we do an event down at um, uh, my office since we did an event there and 30, 40 people showed up and oh my God, 40 people. Well, I'm a baller. <laughs> so then I do another one and 16 people show up and I was stupid enough. And here's what you got to do. You got to be stupid enough to keep going. Yeah. Because I think people try and be too smart and stop. Mm -hmm. 
um, you've got you've got to make a commitment. You've got to have a plan A um, because if you have a plan B, plan A is not. It's just not going to. It's not going to work out. It is not going to work out. And so I, I continued onward, and then we'll stay in Phoenix. I think George was part of this, but he doesn't know the dynamic of this. Joshua Smith reaches out to me because I'm working with broker owners, managers, and broker owner managers. And I'll say it to them; they can listen to me, and that's it's cool. They're cheap. They're just cheap. Okay. Um, <laughs> And that's cool. Um, Joshua Smith reached out and he says, I get it. And I want you guys to hear this too. This was way back in his days um, of, of being a team leader. He said, we are brokerages within a brokerage. And he says, I need to learn how to recruit and I need to do the same things, but within my model, he hired me. And um, I always want to give attribution acknowledgement to people. He just, he just touted and said great things about me. And, um, and I think even, um, you know, I met George through, through Josh. I, I don't, I don't know that, um, you know, so I think it's just really important. You know, you, you, you always remember those people and look at how those things go. And then from that point on, he just opened his big mouth and told everyone I was the man. Um, I stayed stupid enough to keep going. And so fast forward to today, um, you know, I started with one-on-one coaching. People told me, and I remember, um, people who started reaching out to me, I mean, my life was miserable. You guys, it's like, <laughs> Um, Terry Peranich. Terry Peranich is a legend, right? In the industry. He was number one in the world. And so you're getting on coaching calls. Uh, they don't know that, but I'm scared shitless. I just am. And, and, it, and it doesn't matter, by the way, but you ran this big company and you break records. I don't no. care. I have self-doubt. I have yes. fear. I, I I mean, I just like, like Sunday nights suck for me. Mm-hmm. Because Monday morning at 5 a.m., I'm on with freaking ballers every single day. And they've been with me five, six, seven years. And by the way, the minute that goes away, you need to quit your job. Yeah. You need to quit your job. So so then he refers me to Justin Haver. I mean, come on, right? <laughs> and then Sunit. And then Gary Ashton. And then Chris Lindahl. And then, and it's like, like careful what you, I mean, all these things, careful what you wish for. I mean, my life was amazing and miserable at the same time. Yep. Um, but, but, but here's the thing is, is that in, in, in part of that, so it's evolved into that. I, um, I stayed all in, um, I'd gotten sober. I, I went through a series of misadventures in my life and, and, um, it's been 16 years that I got sober and I want you to hear this too, everyone, because it's like, this is, you know, everything going on privately is going to show up publicly. And right now you're being tested in this current market at the, at, at the way that we're, see, you're, you're not tested in your real estate skills. You're tested in your resiliency. You're tested in your grit. You're tested in your ability to go back and see, you know, have I worked on my mental toughness? Because you've got to come to emotions first and tactics second. Yeah. The people that are managing their emotions right now, the people that are are obsessed with their emotional maturity and emotional intelligence, they're winning. And tactically, you're probably better than them. I will show you emotionally mature, emotionally intelligent people that are smoking the tacticians right now, smoking the people that are smarter than them, smoking the people that can give you process and system and all those type of things. So um, then all of a sudden, the CEO of Remax Worldwide hires me. Uh, I though had to clean up my life. And this is one thing that I want to share with you guys here. This story too is, is, um, you need to look in the rear view mirror. And part of my business growth is looking in the rear view mirror. We're taught, I, 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 many people say I'm polarizing because I tell the truth and everything has its duality and you're told, stop looking in the rear view mirror. And, and, and I'm, and I tell you this. The rear view mirror is really, really small because your future is in your past and you need to draw upon those experiences that you've had. You need to draw upon what you've been able to overcome and that's going to help you right now. Each and every one of you right now, anyone struggling right now, screw the market, screw the challenge you have, screw your PL, screw all the challenges that you may have personally and go back and go back to the thing that you've overcome and use that as your bar belief. So I got clean 16 years ago and and I had to uh, overcome 4.3 million in IRS debt. I didn't pay that. I didn't bankrupt. Why do I bring these stories up to you? It's not the I was born in a trailer. Like you ever notice all the internet guys? They were all born in a trailer, and there was no running water. It's the weirdest <laughs> thing, man. It's so crazy. So, so I guess I decided to use the IRS debt, but no, it's true. So so I think I have an unfair advantage, but I want you guys to capture this because it taught me principles. I need, you need to draw upon that. 
I owed the IRS 4.3 million and I had credit card debt. And one lesson that I was taught by my brother in getting clean and, and overcoming those things, you've got to get clean as a human being first. Hmm. And, and especially most of the audience that's listening here, listen, like, like you are exposed. You're exposed and any challenges that you're having with the people you're leading, you got to look in the mirror first. Mm -hmm. And so that was the one thing my brother said, he says, you're not bankrupting. You're going to make, I said, but that's a dumb business decision. He says, no, you need to, you've made great business. You're good in business. He says, but you've never made good decisions morally and done the right thing as a whole as a human being. He said, just do these right things. I said, $4.3 million. He says, I, I'm going to eat top ramen the rest of my life. He said, so what? You're going to feel good about who you are. Um, well, I had one choice and that was to stay focused. I built my business up to doing 114 one-on-one -on -one coaching calls per week. Um, I've posted the image of it, of the report of it. And I did that year after year after year. Um, and there was a great lesson. This wasn't the plan, but there was the great lesson. This is one thing that I want to share with people too, is, is, you know, too many of you want to diversify and you have not mastered anything. And that's the problem. There's mastery, but there's also creating a brand. And those two things I learned by default by having to go all in. Mm. Because then what you create is when you go all in, you create a community. When you create a community, and this is, I'm doing the same thing I did as a branch manager. What I'm talking to you about is the same thing as building a brokerage or building a team. So anyways, um, built it up. And and then what, what happened was, other businesses started to show up because of relationships. So um, today I've got Chip Black Live coaching. Um, the day that I'm no longer one-on-one -on -one coaching, I'm done with this business because it keeps me crisp. I am mm -hmm. real time. I know exactly what's going on. I will always do the one-on-one. -on -one. Oh, you're trading hours for, I, I love the person. You're trading hours for, for um, dollars um, for time. And I said, show me your p and <laughs> Show me yours. I mean, everyone's so brilliant, right? Not to be a jerk, but it's like, you got to stay in the truth. And so one thing I want to point out to you, and Dean says this too, here's the problem leaders are having right now. They left their core competency. 60% yep. of your calendar must be your core competency. What is your number one thing that you do that move? Recruiting, but I hate recruiting. Good. Last time I checked everything you have in your life, that's wonderful. You did things. It wasn't, this is great. And I'm rich now. <laughs> I mean, it's like, stop hallucinating. So anyways, from that, um, now we have um, Digital Maverick and my partner, Preston Guyton. My yeah. responsibility today, what's been really beautiful in my community is my, my average client's been with me about five and six years. People are all smarter than me, all of them. And so we've created Digital Maverick, which is uh, uh, an agency and, and we do, we run ads for people, but, but most importantly, right now, what we're doing is we're doing, um, VAISA database conversion. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a partner with Preston in his, uh, lead, um, national lead portal, easy home search, which we've launched. Um, one of the things, because my fees are pretty high 2000 for a 20 minute coaching call. Um, it's not a lot of people's budget, but I have responsibility today is money will take care of itself is to just impact as many as possible. So then we launched Reside about a year and a half ago, which is a group coaching model that people really have along with some technology. And so we've got Reside, we've got um, uh, Chip Black Life Coaching, we've got um, Easy Home Search, we've got Digital Maverick, and we just launched our mortgage company. And here I am hanging out with you guys having fun. Not dang, that was not supposed to be an introduction. Ta-da! Yeah, yeah. No, what's funny is that when you I said- weave, yeah. I weaved the teaching in there though too, man. I mean, it was there. It was beautiful. Oh yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. And like uh, your your whole, like uh, I'm people find me polarizing because uh, I tell the truth. <laughs> it reminded me of that quote. Uh, you guys have all seen the big short, right? There's like that quote that flashes on the front of the screen at the very beginning of the movie. It's like, uh, truth is like poetry. And most people effing hate poetry <laughs> overheard in a DC bar, <laughs> you know, like, I think it, it's so true, man. It's so true. And like your thought process on grit, like I tell, I've got a bunch of Gen Z employees, right? And my one, one thing mm. that I want to instill in them is grit because that's what my parents staying power, the ability to like continue to stay because a different way of 
that I've always told them this is everybody wants to have confidence in what they're doing next, but you don't get the confidence until you've been courageous in the first place. You, the courage comes before the confidence. You got to be courageous enough to step out there and suck at stuff and keep sucking and keep sucking until one day you have the confidence to actually go, yeah, I think I might be pretty good at this, right? And you're a freaking testament to that exact same mindset, man. It's freaking cool. So yeah, that was the, I, I was in meditation before this and and I have been struggling and you you hit on so many things here, but I think the one that stood out most to me was um, people diversifying before mastery. And I think that I'm actually in that right now. I think, uh, so I sell homes, right? I'm a real estate agent in Scottsdale, Arizona, and I just started a coaching program. It's just a baby six figure mm -hmm. coaching program, but it's a coaching program, right? Mm -hmm. I have an investment portfolio and I'm doing all of these different things. I wrote this book back here this year, I'm doing all of these different things and I haven't mastered any of them. And that kind of go in all in mentality on one thing. I have been straddling what I really want to do, which is coach, uh, because, you know, the, the real estate pays the bills. And I think there's a lot of us out here that we get uh, shiny object syndrome in real estate. It's like, oh, well, you're a real estate agent. You should also be a real estate investor and build a real estate portfolio or, you know, any of these other things. So, so that was really powerful. So I'm super grateful that this was divine timing for me, for sure. So um, you talked a lot about your inspirations. Uh, and, and I guess you, you talked about your mom and you talked about your brother in there. Um, who kind of, you, when you think of your leadership philosophy today, like what are, who are the biggest influences? Was it books? Was it, you know, some type of mindset management process that you have for yourself? Like, how did you get to this today? Because, I mean, you said it's all borrowed from other people who shared and, and gave you wisdom along the way. But it's like, are there are there specific people that you can point to as like the biggest inspirations? Sure, I'll go down the list. I'll give you people in books. Um, I would say the first one was Mark Stark. Mark Stark was the one that recruited me and gave me the opportunity. It, um, I was just a little guy. They'd never hired from outside the organization. And he took a big risk and, and, and put me in. I mean, the guy that was the assistant manager who had already bought a Corvette thought he was just the lay down getting hired and they hired me. So I came in and hated Mark Stark gave me an opportunity that really put me on the map. Um, but he put me on the map by transferring his skill sets to me, his knowledge to me. And, and he was just so artistic in, in, um, in challenging me, um, while giving me the latitude to, to have some runway to bring my potential forward. Uh, Ed Kraftchow, um, uh, founder of, it was Prucal Nevada, Texas, Ed Kraftchow. Um, I, and I can say this, it was a mind working with him and it was beautiful <laughs> because he, just the mastery of what he would do in, in, in getting me to think he knew and to challenge me. Um, he got me to look at things differently while, while teaching me about a PL and and projections and budgets at the same time, the, 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 um, the artistic part of human beings like human relationships. Um, he was really super impactful to me, um, in my business. And then, uh, my mother, of course, um, uh, my mom, like three jobs and she woke up one day in downtown Seattle. One of the jobs was receptionist at a real estate office. She was, uh, she worked the Naval shipyard. She worked four tens there. Then she would go to in Bremerton, Washington, and then she would go to uh, the Harbor Lights, which is an old school bar. She would cocktail on Friday, Saturday nights, and then Saturday, Sundays, she would work in a old school business brokerage. And she looked at the good old boys. So 50 years ago, and she looked at them and said, I can outsell all of you. And uh, she burned the boats. They were doing owner contracts. And she tells me the story. She um, they told her, open the phone book. She called the bar. Um, Cole called a bar and the guy just hung up on her. My mother, <laughs> she um, showed up at the bar at noon and said, what are you doing here? Is this young woman. And she said to him, you hung up on me. <laughs> <laughs> he ended up being um, net net over her career, like, like had the biggest financial impact on her life. Wow. So my mom. My mom has shown just grit and determination and mental toughness there. Um, from a, a, a mentorship standpoint, um, uh, books and, and teachers, you know, these, these people in my life and certainly my brother and my sobriety. Um, but I would go to um, Debbie Ford and um, Gary Zukoff. Um, 
you know, I'm not someone that I read a hundred books. I'm going to tell you that I read uh, the shadow effect a hundred more times the last 12 months. Mm. I think people make that mistake. I'm an all in guy, right? Um, Debbie Ford moved me. Debbie Ford kept me alive. It was my um, ninth from 21 to 41. I did nine rehabs. And the last time it was hospitalization. It was everything. I mean, it was just, it was really, really bad. And in the breakthrough and the shadow work I did with her, um, just, it was just, it changed everything. Um, and then Gary Zukov, I've, sp- I've two times I've gone up on a mountaintop and spent seven days with Gary. Um, and, um, and, uh, it just, those two people there. And then the final, um, is my daughter. Um, yeah, you, um, I mean, you watch someone fight for life every single day. Yeah. And, uh, um, you know, I, I'll go back to, uh, she was about 18 and she, um, she went to the doctors cause she's a woman, right? And she's thinking, Hey, I'm not going to be able to um, have a baby. And the doctor says, no, you won't live through it. And just kind of like where they said, you're not allowed to go on roller coasters. You've got a pacemaker and you've got, you know, all these things in you, pig valves and cow valves, and you know, all this yeah. stuff. And uh, yeah. Okay. She sends me selfies on roller coasters. That's her. <laughs> She shows up at my dining room table and, uh, dad, I'm pregnant. And I said, and I looked at her and I said, so what do you want to do? Um, she said, I want to get to the right doctors. And I said, you're good to go. And, and so my daughter finally, um, has, has been my inspiration. Um, it said she wouldn't live and she just looked at me and she said, I said, good. And she goes, God's got me. I'm good. Mm-hmm. And and I think that, you know, is, is it, I hope people can put the pieces together because I, I was not the dad that, that um, could be someone to turn to because of my alcoholism. Um, I was not someone that could be respected. Um, and um, because of never quitting, trying to quit things that were killing me or, you know, never quitting to try and quit. Um, I was able to look at her and, go, okay, we're going to the Mayo Clinic and I have no insurance and could say, I'm insurance. And I think that, you know, um, I think in a business conversation here is, is what's your mission, man? Yeah. It's what, what, what's your mission? And so people think I'm so motivated and driven and this beast and, and all this stuff. I mean, I don't know. I mean, you tell me if your daughter were to call you up and say, I got a surgery that might cost 500,000 or I got a surgery that might cost this or I might cost that. Um, I don't know how motivated, how disciplined, how committed would you be? And, you know, that's my extreme situation, but we've all got our stuff. So, yeah, um, those are the people that inspire me. And so to do what I do is really easy, man. Hmm. So oh, that's, uh, that's really powerful. Thank you for sharing that. Man. Yeah. Yeah, that's this is that's the kind of stuff as far as like this podcast is concerned. Like that's that's the stuff that we're aiming at to uncover. Like what's the real thing that pushes people? Because like uh, I I had a question around like you, you talk about burning the boats a lot, like your mother burning the mm-hmm. boats and, yeah. uh, you know, other people burning the boats. But like what what would you say is your burning the boats moment in the midst of that journey? Um, uh. I, I, I would say there, there are a couple things because I really didn't get too much into it, but just so people know that the things that I was encountering um, and, and, and everything challenging in my life, no one did to me. No one did. Um, I created all of them. Um, and that's where the freedom is in personal responsibility, freedom in your business and freedom, in your personal relationship, freedom and everything is in that. Um, I would say when um, I, When the coaching wasn't going well and I could have gone back and taken a job and I had job offers and, and I just said, no way, I'm just, I'm just not doing it. I'm going to keep going. And I took losses and losses and losses and losses after that. Um, I think the other, another piece though, too, is, you know, burning the boats can have a couple different um, contexts to it. There's that in going forward in business, but there's also that in, what direction am I going to go to? And we have a history. 
We have a history. See, I'm I'm a 16 year sober. I'm 57. I've got 41. Well, not 41, but from about 21 to 40, I've got 21 years of living on that other side of who I was. I'm still walking out of the forest. I'm 16 years walking out of the forest still. And so the other was when things get really, really challenging is burning the boats of I'm not going back. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and that's just as challenging because that's the easy, easy thing. So I think it's, you know, twofold. So from a business standpoint, I don't know if that answers the question for you. Oh, it but, does. Yeah. I was, what I was getting at was like, yeah, on the business side, great. Burning the boats means focusing on one thing, whatever. But like to your point that our personal realities manifest or create themselves in our actual realities, it starts in here and in, inside oh, of us, yeah. right? Like yeah. that, that moment where you burn the boats to become the John Cheplak that you are today, you know, that moment. And uh, like, what was that moment basically? Yeah. Yeah. It was, um, I, I, I think with my brother, my brother though, to, I, I, he, there you go. My brother, when I was sitting there going, here's what it is. He said, you have made, listen, you know how to make money. He says, you don't know how to be a good person. Hmm. He said, you don't know how to do the next right thing. Right. He said, trust me you guys. I mean, I can't even imagine. I mean, like I just paid off a lot of people didn't know this too. Cause I don't complain. I paid off all of that debt to the IRS just four years ago. When you have that debt, you can't buy things. Yep. And so I want to paint a picture to people. This isn't the, I'm, listen, my daughter lives in a 5,200 square foot multimillion dollar home. That's mine. That doesn't cash flow with my granddaughter. She's a single mom and she's had challenges with court with the father. I got it. I live in a beautiful home here. I've got my farm that's an hour and a half away that I, I mean, you guys, and, 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 and it wasn't about chasing the money. So that's the thing I want you to get to is my brother locking me in and say, just trust me, just do the right thing. And here's the point. Good guys and good gals do finish first mm -hmm. when they don't quit. I said I wasn't going to swear. My wife can't. There's <laughs> <laughs> a, well, a good point of emphasis. So that was perfect. Man, wow. that's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Jo George we, Lindsay. Yeah. I, John, man, I, I've i appreciated you for a number of years. Uh, we've mm -hmm. known each other, you know, early on in, well, my development of a team. Um, I've always appreciated the vulnerability, so I don't know um, if you realize how much that's inspired many. Uh, mm -hmm. So thank you and a ton of gratitude for that. You've always shared the story about your daughter, um, which uh, you can clearly see fuels your why. Uh, uh, thank you for that. And your sobriety too, man. Um, there's a lot in this industry, it, you know, um, people that struggle with that. And so I think you've yeah. inspired many to go down that, that road of sobriety. Um, and so thank you for that too, man. That's huge. And all uh, things I've always known about you, man, like there's nobody that works harder. Um, you know, you, you're continually like the work ethic alone and the resilience. And so that inspired somebody. And so a little story too, you mentioned um, Josh Smith. So I have a ton of gratitude for him as well. You know, he was the first one in this Phoenix market to really kind of what we defined as a team rich. I don't know who else was doing that in the, in the, the nation, but, well, he was a guy, was though, really, he man. Was, wasn't he? That's what I thought. Here he yeah, is. He was the guy. Well, well, and I got connected with you, I, I don't remember how many years ago, 2016, 2017, maybe? 16 or 17, uh, yeah. Yeah. And I, at that point, um, like I was at the beginning stages and talks of Zillow offers coming to Phoenix. Uh, I had a team of 10. A team of 10, <laughs> and I knew there was going to be more opportunity than, than 10 could service. Mm -hmm. And that's when I went to Josh, because Josh was sitting at like 200 agents, I think, at that time. I, I don't remember exactly what he was at, but nobody else was doing that in the industry. And you're the one that helped him get there. And so I reached out to Josh, and this was another thing that you mentioned. Like, there's those little pivotal moments in your career that you go, wow, that, that was a really important conversation that I had. And I asked for help. I asked for help and I find like the, the top doers in this industry, you and I reached out to Josh and I asked for help. People are always willing to give it. It feels like, man, they're always willing to give it. So I would say that I, I got into coaching with John at that point, strictly on recruiting side of it. And we went from 10 agents to 250 agents. Uh, <laughs> and I still use, we still use those tactics today. Um, I think the one, uh, 
the the group accountability stuff. And maybe that's like, I want to go a little tactical here and give these people some takeaways on that recruiting side. You've dropped in a bunch of like tactical nuggets here, Mm -hmm. but the one that I always remember and the questions I still ask when we don't hit our our micro commitments, when we're not doing these things, um, what got in the way, right? Like that is still my favorite question to ask an agent today. Like, give the audience some other, like, sure. nuggets on the recruiting world, micro-commitments, group coaching. Yeah, things. you bet. Well, I want to tell everyone this. This was really funny because I think I did 12-week coaching um, agreements. And just just from the research, you know, that I had done on George, and George George gave me this number, and, and, and he says, I think he had 10. He said, I'm going to have 25. I says, George, we're going to have a problem. I said, so he said, well, what? I said, 12 weeks. Um, George, you're a guy. You're going to hit that 25 before, and we won't know what to do. No, 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 no. <laughs> and so George calls me up. I was I was at a mastermind in Austin, Texas. I remember he goes, John, we have a problem. I says, Oh, yeah, I recruited the coaching freaking contract, you jerk. <laughs> George, George wanted to, you know, just go at a pace. Um, so a couple things that I'd share with you is first of all, let's go into the you know the accountability thing. The first thing I think that, that everyone needs to do right now is go back and revisit with all of your agents and ask them, why are you here? Not a big why. A big why is this. You get a general answer. you got to go to, you know why I'm here. Like, like, and, and so I think that the challenge that people are having right now with people being productive is because that's just a vehicle and, and, and they're, they're leading with logic and not the emotion first. And yeah. any coaching session has to include has to include, okay, listen, I'm your partner. So partner with your agent to, oh, you want a family cottage by this time? Why is that important to you? Going deep with people. So the first thing I'd ask everyone to do, go back to each and every agent and say, you know, I want to recraft the, the, the leader, the coaching relationship. You know, I need to do a better job. And the most important thing is, listen, it's December 31st and you feel really, really good about your life and businesses. What happened in your life? Freedom. That's not enough. Stop being vague. Mm-hmm. Because all the tactics won't matter. You're too bad. You're letting people get away with it. And then what happens is, remember, ladies and gentlemen, I said this earlier, we're in the human resource business. The heart chooses, the mind justifies. The heart chooses, the mind justifies. You better know what, listen, well, if, if you make 50 calls, you'll sell 50 homes a year. That's not going to endure. What am I doing it for? So the first thing to do is stop telling people what to do. Allow them to come to what that answer is. Have them make the commitment, reverse engineer them in. So, you know, we all have like right now, I mean, we're sitting at with multi organizations are doing well for me. It's 52 minute conversations. We've lifted up um, a week period. Um, We've lifted appointments up by 40% by each agent manually writing an email, speaking to the agent, uh, speaking to their database if it's one person. Okay, so we've got those numbers and and great. So we can go into those numbers. Um, Okay, you're going to do this, commit to this. And that's the problem. That's your number, not theirs. You got to reverse engineer them in. So number one, find out what someone wants. What do you want to have happen in your life? Okay, what income is that going to take? You guys, they don't even have the right income to make it happen. They don't even know. Like we're going too fast. Slow down. Simplify, please. Like y'all are trying to put a roof on a house that isn't framed and has no foundation. And you wonder why people don't do any things. The two reasons people don't do things is fear and overwhelm. And we facilitate that. Mm -hmm. So you've got to get people to commit to a number, but then, yeah, but my number is this. Listen, don't worry about what your minimum standard number is because what you come in with as a consultant and say, well, you want to hit that income number. And I know I feel like a moving target. I am a moving target, but I'm the messenger. The market's the message. The consumer is the moving target. So I'm holding up my end of the bargain, okay, and bringing it to you. You want this income. So they've got to commit to a number. Sometimes you both got to arrive there. Stop giving them your number. I'm not saying don't have a 52 and four texts per call and four emails, which are the numbers we see right now that are critical, but you've got to arrive together. You got to have deadlines, and 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 so what we do is we call it the seven steps of accountability, and these are language patterns. Remember this: um, number one way to get a human being to make a choice, make a change, or move into activity is through self discovery. Yeah, 
of discovery. Okay. And when they discover it from within. And so what we do as leaders, our mistake is, is we get into Maslow's hierarchy and needs. And one of our greatest needs is validation. And so by default, you screw up by wanting to give answers. Answers don't move people into action. And by the way, bad news, you can't make anyone do anything and you can't make someone productive. So what's the best way? It's through the seven steps of accountability, a a commitment. And so what we do, whether it's a seven day check-in and check Check-ins for me are based on productivity. You're newer or struggling. Our check-ins are going to be more frequent. More frequent deadlines create greater tension, which causes people to act. And so the questions that you want to ask is, and you go back remedial. Did you have a commitment? Did you keep it? Okay. Um, What got in the way? In the realm, this is the kicker, in the realm of all that's possible, could you have kept the commitment? And this is where, and I don't want to complicate it because I always like to keep it simple, but as we advance, see what I work with, and I want you guys to think about this as leaders that are listening to this. So you have scripts and dialogues and objection handlers for your agents. Tell me about your scripts and dialogues, your leadership scripts and dialogues that no one's worked with you on that you don't practice because you're doing the same thing. You were trying to move someone from point A to point B. Isn't that what you're doing with a buyer or seller? Isn't that what you're doing in a recruiting interview? Oh, so tell me about your language patterns, right? A little sarcasm, but to get people to go, oh, okay, this is important. So in the realm of all it's possible, here's one to weave in though. So, but let me ask you this, okay? If I had put a million dollars on the table, would you have kept the commitment? Of course I would have. Okay, what would you notice about that? What would you notice about that? You've got to you've got to stay and ask. Stop jumping into solution. We go too fast with our most valuable asset that can net you over seven figures over the life of of the relationship. So I've got teams right now, and I'm sure George, you've experienced it. Is some people um, contribute seven figures in a year to the team retained company dollar, but you want to go fast. You've got to take the time. So. Did you have a commitment? Did you keep it? What got in the way? Um, in the realm of us possible, could you have kept it? Here's the kicker. You know, we pull the money one in there. Why do I bring that one in? So, so let me ask you this. So is there enough money in an equation to keep you doing it? Well, here's what we know. There's never been enough money in an equation. Mm-hmm. So what I want you to take a look yeah. at, okay, is what endures our principles. Let's talk about your principles. So now I'm developing a human being, right? So here's the other kicker. What did you learn about yourself by not keeping the commitment? So they're just sitting in the box and leaders. See, it doesn't feel comfortable holding someone accountable because it feels like friction. I'm like, I just walk in. So how'd it go? So did you keep your commitment? What'd you learn? Okay. Knowing what you know now, what would you do? Really? What else? What do you think? And so you got to look at body language. Language is important, but your body language and your tone, but also your energy that you're exhausting. That's why leaders don't stay in, uh, inspired in what they're doing. Is they're telling and expecting and, and they bring this energy with them. So um, as we move down that path, what did you learn? Okay. Knowing what you know now, what would you do different? Okay. Sometimes you'll weave in there. Well, can I ask you this, George? Are you, and, and notice what I do. Too. Are you really committed? to the business? Oh, Of course I am. Okay. Well, um, let's check follow up boss. And so, I hear what you're saying, but what does follow-up boss say about the commitment? And it's just, you've got to stay it and no judgment. Okay. And, and so you've got to look at your tone. You've got to look at the questions. You've got to get them to go deep. Right. And then the final, how do you wrap out that type of a session where you wrap out that type of a session is, well, here's the cool thing. You were supposed to have 50, you know, not supposed to, but, but 52 minute conversations are where you're at. You had 20. Okay. Um, Congratulations on the 20. Let's, let's talk about that. How did you get that 20? Okay. Okay, great. So, so now let's go into, here's where I go to in its language. So 20 to 50 is a gap. I love the gap hmm. Why? because growth is in the gap. And aren't we here to grow together? We are. Okay, great. So how can I best support you to fill that gap over the next week? And so that's the process, that self-discovery stuff and sitting in the box. I love it, John. Like, I don't know if the audience can appreciate, like, how gold that is. Like, it seems 
uncomplicated in a way, right? Like it's not super complicated, um, but it literally changed the way that we hold accountability within mm -hmm. our team and the parade mm -hmm. of productivity showed from that. And mm -hmm. the retention was probably the other factor. Um, when you run this, oh, I think by nature, some of us want to run this like militant sales organization. Um, and, and that can work. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm but you're going to be fighting retention a lot. Right. And so when, once you get into their why, once you get into you dig deeper and you really uh, care about the human and you're trying to achieve the goals together, man, and you ask those questions and with that tone, it changes everything. So everything. take it, man. Yeah. So I've got one more question. Um, yeah. And then we'll let Jess and Lizzie jump back in here, but sure. Sure. Today, today's, a, I think that there's a lot of uneasiness in the industry right now. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're a leader of leaders. Mm -hmm. um, how would you coach somebody today to navigate the disruption that's going on in the industry? NAR settlement. Mm -hmm. I mean, we just saw another um, uh, lawsuit between Homey and NAR. Like, there's a lot of things still at unrest. Where should a leader like me, mm -hmm. when I have a bunch of nervous, scared agents out there, mm -hmm. where should I spend my time today? Because 60% of your time in the core competency. Um, what is that core competency today? And does it shift in times like this? Yeah, really good question. Um, I think there's two parts. I think your first thing I'm asking all my leaders to do is check in on your leaders. They pull the leaders in together and they look at the objective. And I'm not saying this is you, George, you run a fine organization. I'm sure it's not that way. And I know that you, you do a great job of building community and culture, but I think, I think the key thing to do is, is we get these leaders in the room and we've got to do this and we've got to do that. And it's just the, this, you know, scramble mode. Instead of how much time leaders, here's what you got to do. Sit down one-on-one -on -one with each of your people and say, how are you doing? Um, we're in a heavy time and I know it's heavy. And, and I know that, that um, you know, the, the salespeople speak English and the, um, the staff operations speaks German. And how can we bring that together to support you? What are some ways we can do that? So I think the first thing is, is really just checking in on them and supporting them. Um, anything you can do from a personal development standpoint, 100%. Everything right now is personal development. Everything right here is mindset. I think it's educating people also that, um, that um, mental toughness is... Um, Mental toughness is not something you go read in a book or in a seminar. I just posted about this yesterday. Mental toughness is developed by walking through this path. The other thing is you're, is you're speaking to your agents is have them go back and revisit um, where, uh, why they're here. Okay. Have them go back and revisit um, what they've overcome. Your next team meeting and we, and, and Dan Beer is still to this day says it's his best one he ever does. Your next team meeting, um, we're going off the best team meeting is the one that you do off agenda. And so I'd say, you know what, let's go around the room. So like right now, George, we're on a call and I'm going here, George, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go off agenda and I want you to go around the room and ask everyone the thing that, you know, you can be as transparent. This is safe as could be the safest room here is what's the one thing that we, we don't know here that, that you've overcome and you're most proud of. Hmm. And, and you're going to, like you're going to shift and watch this thing just go crazy. I mean, it gets wild, wild. It, um, and because when we understand what everyone's going through and or has gone through, we come together as a community. And, and right now you need community more than anything. So your job is to build that community, not just take them out to an event, but like when you go really deep, so each person go around the room and then each person goes around the room and these things have gone on for an hour and a half and two hours and people haven't left. The next thing go around and say, good, here's what I need each one of you to do is write down your single most greatest challenge or frustration right now that you are having in the business that you need to overcome. And I want you to draw upon that one thing. That's mm -hmm. number one. Uh, number two, my language right now is what I'm doing too. We do a T square controllables versus uncontrollables. And so we always go back and we revisit the, the controllables constantly. The other thing that I'm very transparent about, and so it's really in your sales meetings, your coaching and your training of your agents. We know the numbers. I mean, George, you know the numbers as well as anyone in this industry. And if they change, you're talking to people, getting input. I mean, we know those things, but how do you get the people to do the things they need to do? 
right? You've got to move those human beings, right? So, so it's, it, it is constantly reminding them also and bringing up to them. Um, let me ask you this and have some fun. Listen, doesn't it seem like I sit up at night and just thinking about how can I make them make more calls? I'll zoom in. <laughs> I zoom into mega teams and do these meetings, George. How do I like, like really like, like have them feel like you're walking beside them. Mm -hmm. Okay. And let them know that, and, 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 and you know what I do, I do stay up at night. My pillow talk with my wife is how can I support these people to have their dreams, hopes, and desires come through? Yeah. And, and, and so this is where that language comes in really, really critical and talk about you keeping up your end of the obligation. And so it, it is, it is going into logic, but at the same time building their mindset you know, we've got less transactions this year. What do you think that requires us to do as individuals to get the income we want and getting them to come up with the answers? The final piece that I share with them, though, too, is, is um, this isn't hype. This is, and these are the scripting and the language that I'm doing with my team leaders for their sales meetings. I mean, we're choreographing meetings and trainings is I'll ask them to say, let me ask you this. Do you think this conversation's happening down the road? Do you think it's happening, the, the, the emotions you're feeling? Do you think it's happening in New York and Florida in Vancouver and Calgary with Justin Haver? It is. Mm -hmm. What do you know about people when challenges and frustrations, what do you feel like you want to do? They most they either freeze or they quit. So here's what we know. We know there's tons of unknowns. We know that we're committed to training and coaching and being out in front but the one thing that we're going to do is we're going to be obsessed with doing the next right thing right. And here's the thing that I want each and every one of you to know. There will be people that won't make it through a challenging time. And that's where the most opportune time is for you. So you are reselling. I mean, you're you're getting them to go back to a borrowed belief of where they've overcome. You're using contrast of what other agents um, are going to choose to do. And, and then... Then you're bringing them back to, okay, now guess what? Is it fair to say that A, I'm going to be a moving target because the consumer is a moving target and that we are in a business where math is the path? So it's just a constant re-enrollment, George. The idea of opening up and having people share about uh, things that they've overcome in their life, right? Like I, I come from church world and still participate in church world, all of that. When it, there's an important aspect to getting a community together and sharing like testimonies of things that are going well in life because it gives hope and uh, faith to everybody else that's in that room, right? It right. inspires them forward. And sometimes in life, you do have to draw upon the hope and the faith of the people around you for your own thing that you're going through as well, right? It lets everybody Everybody know like maybe it's possible for me you know uh that's so powerful and also vulnerable like i don't think i think everybody gets into these business conversations and they forget about the human that's the most beautiful thing about you is that like man we're in the human business so yeah. that's I, still I, think, I think too though george what i would say is to and this is great you know speaking to a team leader here is you've got to move to the tougher conversations quicker than you ever have in your life yeah everyone has to move to them quicker but what you've got to do is, is here's the big piece I would say, because you've got a bunch of leaders with you too, is, is remember this and have them really think about it. Stop being part of the message. You're the messenger. Mm -hmm. Stop being part of the message. You're the messenger. Because when you are part of the message, then it's a personality issue and personality issues, which are what get in the way of retention or can create, hey, listen, I'm, the, I'm holding up my end of the bargain. What did you say you want? Okay. And, and then going deeper with them mm. and saying, so, so, so I feel all I'm doing is holding up my end of the bargain, George, here's one thing, you know, or and I can say it to a body of them, or I can say it one-on-one, -on -one. George, I have two choices. Six months from now, financially you're struggling or it's not turning out the way you want to. And, and how would you feel if I said, well, you know, if you would have bumped up to 52 minute conversations, <laughs> if you would have sent four emails that you wrote and thought about, I'm talking to one person, if you had a four to one text ratio, you'd be blowing the doors off. Do, did you want me to do that six months when it's too late? Or do you want me to do it up front? And we've got to just keep revisit. I'm holding up my end of the obligation. You've got to preface these when you go into these, Hey, listen, Love you. I'm here for you. I'm always going to tell you the truth. And I know it's not going to be what you want to hear, but let's remember, let me ask you this. Can you share something with me? 
that um, you're really, really proud of that was on the other side of work that you never thought you'd be able to do? Okay, good. We're going to use that here. So I think we, we've got to just keep revisiting, revisiting, revisiting. And we've got to acknowledge the littlest of things more often than we've ever. I want your entire staff, George, to constantly be looking. I want you to hear about, like, I mean, like acknowledgement is everything right now. The little things. Sally just took a look. Like I go back to your sales manager and I'd say, listen, you need to be on a daily basis acknowledging the first sale of an agent on your team everywhere on social media, everywhere in your internal mechanisms. You need to, because it's going to do two things. It's going to say, what the hell's going on over there? The Lawton group. So it's a marketing piece, but it's a massive acknowledgement piece. Okay. And so that type of stuff too. Love it, man. So I feel like I just got a coaching call. Like I just got a coaching call here. I love it. I got so many takeaways. I'm going to literally like send this to our engineering team as well on our side. Like, I just, so, this is universal. It, it, it goes above everything. Let me everything. give you guys one other thing too, George, because I don't know if we did this one, but you guys, and I'll, and I'll send it to you, George. Um, and you may have seen it floating around. Listen, feedback loops are most critical right now. And, and EOS has got it. But my I've used this one since 1995 and have been taught it. Um, I'll send you the doc and how you frame it out. You've got to do feedback loops right now on a minimum quarterly basis. Dear George, please keep doing, tell me everything we're doing. That's great. The staff is doing everything. We're doing. George, please stop doing. Okay. Listen, this is a safe environment. The, Jerry McGuire, help me help you. I mean, you guys need to be safe. If you want to do it confidentially, I don't care. I need to know. I need to know. Please stop doing. Okay. Please keep, please stop. Please start doing, start doing. What are you seeing out there? You're hearing and seeing some things, okay? And there's a fourth one. Here's what we need to know, you guys, as a culture, right? We live in a we live in a relationship of mutual accountability. What I'm doing, see, and I'm always culturizing. Like that sales meeting, man, you were just constantly framing and, and future pacing and reminding people of the mission, the values, and the principles. Now, one of the things we believe in is fair exchange, right? I am open to your feedback at the same time. I want to ask for something back to you. So number four says, here's how I'm going to support the growth of the organization. Then what you do, George, and you let them know, so you guys, and, and, and this is one you have to do where you go off agenda, okay? And here's what we're going to, oh, I don't have time. Oh, we got time. You can leave when you turn it in. We'll be fine. They will never email them back to you. They will never turn them in. Don't do it. It won't. You'll you'll blow it up. It'll bomb. Ladies and gentlemen, here's what I'm going to do. In two weeks, I'm going to respond back to you. You find a common theme in the please stop. You can have 400 agents. You can find eight, 10 common themes. Please stop doing. That's a great idea. We kept doing it thinking you loved it. Okay. Please stop. Doing. No, we will continue to charge a technology fee because as our business partner, straight freaking answers, George, like, like people don't need the answer they want. We avoid it. They just want an answer. And so what it does is it takes care of that vapor that doesn't turn into a fog in the organization. And you'll deliver back via email, the feedback loops of please keep, please start, please stop. You'll deliver that back at email two weeks later in a sales meeting. Say, check your email. It's there, but here's what we're going to do pass out the here's how I'm going to support the organization and you read every freaking one of them out in front of everyone at that sales meeting. I love it. That one. Sure. There. I got, I got some tactics to implement here, <laughs> for sure. Man. I was, uh, uh, rich. Powerful as always. I'm dangerous. I'll just go on a roll, man. <laughs> We're here for it. We're here for it. Thank you so much. I feel like, um, like I said earlier, this was divine timing for me. It was messages I needed to hear on yeah. multiple different levels. Um, so I'm super grateful. Uh, you made me cry, and I am not a crier. No, that's um, true. I, 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 so I, I, I didn't want to call that out in the moment because it felt special. But yeah, you yeah. made Lindsay cry, and she does not cry. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not a. I'm not a emotional crier. I cry mm. only when I'm mad or extremely extremely tired for him like a baby, but, um, <laughs> but, uh, anyways, thank you so much, John, for being here. That was, um, that was incredible. And I think everyone in the audience is going to, you know, feel that your mission really is to be in service and mm -hmm. contribute value back, which is our why. I mean, when we sat down to create this podcast, our why was like, how can we get back to the industry that's given so much to us? Um, and I love that you have that, that shared value as well. So thank you for being here. Really appreciate it. I appreciate you guys. Appreciate Thank you. Guys. You bet. Awesome. awesome, guys. Well, well, that's a wrap for this episode of the Inspection Period by State Media. A huge thank you, John, man, for joining us today and sharing the you know, like incredible <laughs> stories as always. Uh, insights on leadership and power and grit in real estate. 
If you found value in our conversation, make sure to subscribe and hit the uh, notification bell on YouTube. Uh, Leave a review on Spotify or wherever you're listening and share this episode with someone in your network. Uh, So awesome, John. Once again, man, huge, huge thank you, dude. Uh, Love love sharing everything with you, man. So a ton of gratitude and what you've done for the industry. Appreciate you. Thanks, you guys. Appreciate you. Thanks. And as a reminder, inspection period listeners get a full 30-day trial of Bub. No contract, no credit card required. Just go to followupboss.com forward slash inspection period for more details.